Chapter 10 of the D'Arblay Mystery Marion's Peril The mist, which had been gathering since the early afternoon, began to thicken ominously as I approached Abbey Road, Hornsey, from Crouch End Station, causing me to quicken my pace so that I might make my destination before the fog closed in. For this was my first visit to Marion D'Arblay's studio, and the neighborhood was strange to me. And in fact I was none too soon, for hardly had I set my hand on the quaint bronze knocker above the plate inscribed Mr. J. D'Arblay, when the adjoining houses grew pale and shadowy and then vanished altogether. My elaborate knock, in keeping with the distinguished knocker, was followed by soft, quick footsteps, the sound whereof set my heart ticking in double-quick time. The door opened, and there stood Miss D'Arblay, garbed in a most alluring blue smock or pinafore, with sleeves rolled up to the elbow, with a smile of friendly welcome on her comely face, and looking so sweet and charming that I yearned then and there to take her in my arms and kiss her. This, however, being inadmissible, I shook her hand warmly and was forthwith conducted through the outer lobby into the main studio, where I stood looking about me with amused surprise. She looked at me inquiringly as I emitted an audible chuckle. It is a queer-looking place, said I, something between a miracle shrine hung with votive offerings from sufferers who had been cured of sore heads and arms and legs, and a meat emporium in a cannibal district. It is nothing of the kind, she exclaimed indignantly. I don't mind the votive offerings, but I reject the cannibal meat market as a gross and libelous fiction. But I suppose it does look rather queer to a stranger. To a what? I demanded fiercely. Oh, I only meant a stranger to the place, of course, and you know I did, so you needn't be cantankerous. She glanced smilingly round the studio, and for the first time, apparently, the oddity of its appearance dawned on her, for she laughed softly and then turned a mischievous eye on me as I gaped about me like a bumpkin at a fair. The studio was a very large and lofty room or hall, with a partially glazed roof and a single large window just below the skylight. The walls were fitted partly with rows of large shelves, and the remainder with ranks of pegs. From the latter hung row after row of casts of arms, hands, legs, and faces, especially faces, while the shelves supported a weird succession of heads, busts, and a few half-length but armless figures. The general effect was very strange and uncanny, and what made it more so was the fact that all the heads presented perfectly smooth, bare craniums. Are artists' models usually bald? I inquired, as I noted this latter phenomenon. Now you are being foolish, she replied, willfully and deliberately foolish. You know very well that all these heads have got to be fitted with wigs, and you couldn't fit a wig to a head that already had a fine covering of plaster curls. But I must admit that it rather detracts from the beauty of a girl's head if you represent it without hair. The models used to hate it when they were shown with heads like old gentlemen's, and so did poor Daddy. In fact, he usually rendered the hair in the clay, just sketchily, for the sake of the model's feelings and his own, and took it off afterwards with a wire tool. But there is the kettle boiling over. I must make the tea. While this ceremony was being performed, I strolled round the studio and inspected the casts, more particularly the heads and faces. Of these latter, the majority were obviously modeled, but I noticed a number with closed eyes having very much the appearance of death masks. When we had taken our places at the little table near the great gas ring, I inquired what they were. They do look rather cadaverous, don't they, she said, as she poured out the tea. But they are not death masks. They are casts from living faces, mostly from the faces of models. But my father always used to take a cast from anyone who would let him. They are quite useful to work from, though, of course, the eyes have to be put in from another cast or from life. It must be rather an unpleasant operation, I said, having the plaster poured over the face. How does the victim manage to breathe? The usual plan is to put little tubes or quills into the nostrils. But my father could keep the nostrils free without any tubes. He was a very skillful molder, and then he always used the best plaster, which set very quickly, so that it only took a few minutes. And how are you getting on? And what were you doing when I came in? I am getting on quite well, she replied. My work has been passed as satisfactory, and I have three new commissions. 
When you came in, I was just getting ready to make a mold for a head and shoulders. After tea, I shall go on with it, and you shall help me. But tell me about yourself. You have finished with Dr. Cornish, haven't you? Yes, I am a gentleman at large for the time being, but that won't do. I shall have to look out for another job. I hope it will be a London job, she said. Arabella and I would feel quite lonely if you went away even for a week or two. We both look forward so much to our little family gathering on Sunday afternoon. You don't look forward to it as much as I do, I said warmly. It is difficult for me to realize that there was ever a time when you were not a part of my life. And yet we are quite new friends. Yes, she said, only a few weeks old. But I have the same feeling. I seem to have known you for years, and as for Arabella, she speaks of you as if she had nursed you from infancy. You have a very insinuating way with you. Oh, don't spoil it by calling me insinuating, I protested. No, I won't, she replied. It was the wrong word. I meant sympathetic. You have the gift of entering into other people's troubles and feeling them as if they were your own, which is a very precious gift to the other people. Your troubles are my own, said I, since I have the privilege to be your friend. But I have been a happier man since I shared them. It is very nice of you to say that, she murmured, with a quick glance at me and just a faint heightening of color, and then for a while neither of us spoke. Have you seen Dr. Thorndyke lately? she asked, when she had refilled our cups, and thereby, as it were, punctuated our silence. Yes, I answered. I saw him only a night or two ago, and that reminds me that I was commissioned to make some inquiries. Can you tell me if your father ever did any electrotype work for outsiders? I don't know, she answered. He used latterly to electrotype most of his own work instead of sending it to the bronze founders, but it is hardly likely that he would do electros for outsiders. There are firms who do nothing else, and I know that when he was busy, he used to send his work to them. But why do you ask? I related to her what Thorndyke had told me, and pointed out the importance of ascertaining the facts, which he saw at once. As soon as we have finished tea, she said, we will go and look over the cupboard where the electro molds were kept, that is, the permanent ones. The gelatin molds for works in the round couldn't be kept. They were melted down again. But the waterproof plaster molds were stored away in this cupboard, and the gutta percha ones too, until they were wanted to soften down to make new molds. And even if the molds were destroyed, Father usually kept a cast. Would you be able to tell by looking through the cupboard? I asked. Yes, I should know a strange mold, of course, as I saw all the original work that he did. Have we finished? Then let us go and settle the question now. She produced a bunch of keys from her pocket and crossed the studio to a large, tall cupboard in a corner. Selecting a key, she inserted it and was trying vainly to turn it when the door came open. She looked at it in surprise and then turned to me with a somewhat puzzled expression. This is really very curious, she said. When I came here this morning, I found the outer door unlocked. Naturally, I thought I must have forgotten to lock it, though that would have been an extraordinary oversight. And now I find this door unlocked. But I distinctly remember locking it before going away last night, when I had put back the box of modeling wax. What do you make of that? It looks as if someone had entered the studio last night with false keys or by picking the lock. But why should they? Perhaps the cupboard will tell. You will know if it has been disturbed. She ran her eyes along the shelves and said at once, It has been. The things are all in disorder and one of the molds is broken. We had better take them all out and see if anything is missing, so far as I can judge, that is, for the molds were just as my father left them. We dragged a small work table to the cupboard and emptied the shelves one by one. She examined each mold as we took it out, and I jotted down a rough list at her dictation. When we had been through the whole collection and rearranged the molds on the shelves, they were mostly plaques and medallions, she slowly read through the list and reflected for a few moments. At length she said, I don't miss anything that I can remember, but the question is, were there any molds or casts that I did not know about? I am thinking of Dr. Thorndyke's question. If there were any, they have gone, so that question cannot be answered. We looked at one another gravely, and in both our minds was the same unspoken question. Who was it that had entered the studio last night? 
We had just closed the cupboard and were moving away when my eye caught a small object half hidden in the darkness under the cupboard itself, the bottom of which was raised by low feet about an inch and a half from the floor. I knelt down and passed my hand into the shallow space and was just able to hook it out. It proved to be a fragment of a small plaster mold, saturated with wax and black leaded on the inside. Miss Diarbley stooped over it eagerly and exclaimed, I don't know that one. What a pity it is such a small piece, but it is certainly part of a coin. It is part of the coin, said I. There can be no doubt of that. I examined the cast that Dr. Thorndyke made and I recognized this as the same. There is the lower part of the bust, the letter C-A, the first two letters of Carolus, and the tiny elephant in castle. That is conclusive. This is the mold from which the electrotype was made. But I had better hand it to Dr. Thorndyke to compare with the cast that he has. I carefully bestowed the fragment in my tobacco pouch, as the safest place for the time being, and meanwhile Miss D'Arblay looked fixedly at me with a very singular expression. You realize, she said in a hushed voice, what this means. He was in here last night. I nodded. The same conclusion had instantly occurred to me, and a very uncomfortable one it was. There was something very sinister and horrid in the thought of that murderous villain quietly letting himself into the studio and ransacking his hiding places in the dead of the night. So unpleasantly suggestive was it that for a time neither of us spoke a word, but stood looking blankly at one another in silent dismay. And in the midst of the tense silence there came a knock at the door. We both started as if we had been struck. Then Miss D'Arblay, recovering herself quickly, said, I had better go, and hurried down the studio to the lobby. I listened nervously, for I was a little unstrung. I heard her go into the lobby and open the outer door. I heard a low voice, apparently asking a question. The outer door closed, and then came a sudden scuffling sound and a piercing shriek. With a shout of alarm, I raced down the studio, knocking over a chair as I ran, and darted into the lobby just as the outer door slammed. For a moment I hesitated. Miss D'Arblay had shrunk into a corner and stood in the semi-darkness with both her hands pressed tightly to her breast. But she called out excitedly, Follow him! I am not hurt! And on this I wrenched open the door and stepped out. But the first glance showed me that the pursuit was hopeless. The fog had now become so dense that I could hardly see my own feet. I dared not leave the threshold for fear of not being able to find my way back. Then she would be alone, and he was probably lurking close by even now. I stood irresolute, stock still, listening intently. The silence was profound. All the natural noises of a populous neighborhood seemed to be smothered by the dense blanket of dark yellow vapor. Not a sound came to my ear. No stealthy footfall, no rustle of movement nothing but stark silence. Uneasily, I crept back until the open doorway showed as a dim rectangle of shadow, crept back and peered fearfully into the darkness of the lobby. She was still standing in the corner, an upright smudge of deeper darkness in the obscurity, but even as I looked, the shadowy figure collapsed and slid noiselessly to the floor. In an instant the pursuit was forgotten, and I darted into the lobby, shutting the outer door behind me, and dropped on my knees at her side. Where she had fallen, a streak of light came in from the studio, and the sight that it revealed turned me sick with terror. The whole front of her smock, from the breast downwards, was saturated with blood. Both her hands were crimson and gory, and her face was dead white to the lips. For an instant I was paralyzed with horror. I could see no movement of breathing, and the white face with its parted lips and half-closed eyes was as the face of the dead, but when I dared to search for the wound, I was a little reassured, for closely as I scrutinized it, the gory smock showed no sign of a cut excepting on the blood-stained right sleeve. And now I noticed a deep gash on the left hand, which was still bleeding freely, and was probably the source of the blood which had soaked the smock. There seemed to be no vital wound. With a deep breath of relief, I hastily tore my handkerchief into strips and applied the improvised bandage tightly enough to control the bleeding. Then with the scissors from my pocket case, which I now carried from habit, I laid open the blood-stained sleeve. The wound on the arm, just above the elbow, was quite shallow, a glancing wound, which tailed off upwards into a scratch. 
A turn of the remaining strip of bandage secured it for the time being, and this done, I once more explored the front of the smock, pulling its folds tightly apart in search of the dreaded cut. But there was none, and now the bleeding being controlled, it was safe to take measures of restoration. Tenderly, and not without effort, I lifted her and carried her into the studio, where was a shabby but roomy couch, on which poor Diarblaise had been accustomed to rest when he stayed for the night. On this I laid her, and fetching some water and a towel, dabbed her face and neck. Presently she opened her eyes and heaved a deep sigh, looking at me with a troubled, bewildered expression, and evidently only half-conscious. Suddenly her eye caught the great blood stain on her smock, and her expression grew wild and terrified. For a few moments she gazed at me with eyes full of horror. Then, as the memory of her dreadful experience rushed back on her, she uttered a little cry and burst into tears, moaning and sobbing almost hysterically. I rested her head on my shoulder and tried to comfort her, and she, poor girl, weak and shaken by the awful shock, clung to me trembling and wept passionately with her face buried in my breast. As for me, I was almost ready to weep too, if only from sheer relief and revulsion from my late terrors. Marion, darling, I murmured into her ear as I stroked her damp hair. Poor dear little woman, it was horrible, but you mustn't cry any more now. Try to forget it, dearest. She shook her head passionately. I can never do that, she sobbed. It will haunt me as long as I live. Oh, and I am so frightened, even now. What a coward I am. Indeed you are not, I exclaimed. You were just weak from loss of blood. Why did you let me leave you, Marion? I didn't think I was hurt, and I wasn't particularly frightened then, and I hoped that if you followed him you might be caught. Did you see him? No, there is a thick fog outside. I didn't dare to leave the threshold. Were you able to see what he was like? She shuddered and choked down a sob. He is a dreadful-looking man, she said. I loathed him at the first glance. A beetle-browed, hook-nosed wretch, with a face like that of some horrible bird of prey. But I couldn't see him very distinctly, for it is rather dark in the lobby, and he wore a wide-brimmed hat, pulled down over his brows. Would you know him again, and can you give a description of him that would be of use to the police? I am sure I should know him again, she said with a shudder. It was a face that one could never forget, a hideous face, the face of a demon. I can see it now, and it will haunt me, sleeping and waking, until I die. Her words ended with a catch of the breath, and she looked piteously into my face with wide, terrified eyes. I took her trembling hand and once more drew her head to my shoulder. You mustn't think that, dear, said I. You are all unstrung now, but these terrors will pass. Try to tell me quietly just what this man was like. What was his height, for instance? He was not very tall not much taller than I, and he was rather slightly built. Could you see whether he was dark or fair? He was rather dark. I could see a shock of hair sticking out from under his hat, and he had a mustache with turned-up ends and a beard, a rather short beard. And now as to his face, you say he had a hooked nose? Yes, a great high bridge nose like the beak of some horrible bird, and his eyes seemed to be deep-set under heavy brows with bushy eyebrows. The face was rather thin, with high cheekbones, a fierce, scowling, repulsive face. And the voice, should you know that again? I don't know, she answered. He spoke in quite a low tone, rather indistinctly, and he said only a few words, something about having come to make some inquiries about the cost of a wax model. Then he stepped into the lobby and shut the outer door, and immediately, without another word, he seized my right arm and struck at me. But I saw the knife in his hand, and as I called out I snatched at it with my left hand, so that it missed my body and I felt it cut my right arm. Then I got hold of his wrist. But he had heard you coming, and wrenched himself free. The next moment he had opened the door and rushed out, shutting it behind him. She paused and then added in a shaking voice, If you had not been here, if I had been alone. We won't think of that, Marion. You were not alone, and you will never be again in this place. I shall see to that. At this she gave a little sigh of satisfaction and looked into my face with the pallid ghost of a smile. Then I shan't be frightened any more, she murmured, 
and closing her eyes she lay for a while, breathing quietly as if asleep. She looked very delicate and frail, with her waxen cheeks and the dark shadows under her eyes, but still I noted a faint tinge of color stealing back into her lips. I gazed down at her with fond anxiety, as a mother might look at a sleeping child that had just passed the crisis of a dangerous illness. Of the bare chance that had snatched her from imminent death I would not allow myself to think. The horror of that moment was too fresh for the thought to be endurable. Instead I began to occupy myself with the practical question as to how she was to be got home. It was a long way to North Grove, some two miles I reckoned, too far for her to walk in her present weak state, and there was the fog. Unless it lifted it would be impossible for her to find her way, and I could give her no help, as I was a stranger to this locality. Nor was it by any means safe, for our enemy might still be lurking near, waiting for the opportunity that the fog would offer. I was still turning over these difficulties when she opened her eyes and looked up at me a little shyly. I'm afraid I've been rather a baby, she said, but I am much better now. Hadn't I better get up? No, I answered. Lie quiet and rest. I am trying to think how you were to be got home. Didn't you say something about a caretaker? Yes, a woman in the little house next door, which really belongs to the studio. Daddy used to leave the key with her at night so that she could clean up. But I just fetch her in when I want her help. Why do you ask? Do you think she could get a cab for us? I am afraid not. There is no cab stand anywhere near here. But I think I could walk, unless the fog is too thick. Shall we go and see what it is like? I will go, said I, rising, but she clung to my arm. You are not to go alone, she said in sudden alarm. He may be there still. I thought it best to humor her, and accordingly helped her to rise. For a few moments she seemed rather unsteady on her feet, but soon she was able to walk, supported by my arm, to the studio door which I opened, and through which wreaths of vapor drifted in. But the fog was perceptibly thinner, and even as I was looking across the road at the now faintly visible houses, two spots of dull yellow light appeared up the road, and my ear caught the muffled sound of wheels. Gradually the lights grew brighter, and at length there stole out of the fog the shadowy form of a cab with a man leading the horse at a slow walk. Here seemed a chance of escape from our dilemma. Go in and shut the door while I speak to the cabman, said I. He may be able to take us. I shall give four knocks when I come back. She was unwilling to let me go, but I gently pushed her in and shut the door, and then advanced to meet the cab. A few words set my anxieties at rest, for it appeared that the cabman had to set down a fare a little way along the street, and was very willing to take a return fare, on suitable terms. As any terms would have been suitable to me under the circumstances, the cabman was able to make a good bargain, and we parted with mutual satisfaction and a cordial au revoir. Then I stared back along the fence to the studio door on which I struck four distinct knocks and announced myself vocally by name. Immediately the door opened and a hand drew me in by the sleeve. I am so glad you have come back, she whispered. It was horrid to be alone in the lobby even for a few minutes. What did the cabman say? I told her the joyful tidings and we at once made ready for our departure. In a minute or two the welcome glare of the cab lamps reappeared and when I had locked up the studio and pocketed the key, I helped her into the rather ramshackle vehicle. I don't mind admitting that the cabman's charges were extortionate, but I grudged him never a penny. It was probably the slowest journey that I had ever made, but yet the funereal pace was all too swift. Half ashamed as I was to admit it to myself, this horrible adventure was bearing sweet fruit to me in the unquestioned intimacy that had been born in the troubled hour. Little enough was said, but I sat happily by her side, holding her uninjured hand in mine, on the pretense of keeping it warm, blissfully conscious that our sympathy and friendship had grown to something sweeter and more precious. "'What are we to say to Arabella?' I asked. "'I suppose she will have to be told.' "'Of course she will,' replied Marion. "'You shall tell her. But,' she added in a lower tone, "'you needn't tell her everything.' I mean, what a baby I was and how you had to comfort and soothe me. She is as brave as a lion, and she thinks I am too. So you needn't undeceive her too much. I needn't undeceive her at all, said I, because you are. 
and we were still arguing this weighty question when the cab drew up at Ivy Cottage. I sent the cabman off, rejoicing, and then escorted Marion up the path to the door where Miss Bowler was waiting, having apparently heard the cab arrive. "'Thank goodness!' she exclaimed. "'I was wondering how on earth you would manage to get home.' Then she suddenly observed Marion's bandaged hand and uttered an exclamation of alarm. "'Miss Marion has cut her hand rather badly,' I explained. "'We won't talk about it just now. "'I will tell you everything presently when you have put her to bed. "'Now I want some stuff to make dressings and bandages.' Miss Bowler looked at me suspiciously, but made no comment. With extraordinary promptitude she produced a supply of linen, warm water, and other necessities, and then stood by to watch the operation and give assistance. "'It is a nasty wound,' I said, as I removed the extemporized dressing, but not so bad as I feared. There will be no lasting injury. I put on the permanent dressing and then exposed the wound on the arm, at the sight of which Miss Bowler's eyebrows went up. But she made no remark, and when a dressing had been put on this too, she took charge of the patient to conduct her up to the bedroom. "'I shall come up and see that she is all right before I go,' said I, "'and meanwhile no questions, Arabella.' She cast a significant look at me over her shoulder and departed with her arm about the patient's waist. The rites and ceremonies above stairs were briefer than I had expected. Perhaps the promised explanations had accelerated matters. At any rate, in a few minutes Miss Bowler bustled into the room and said, "'You can go up now, but don't stop to gossip. I am bursting with curiosity.' Thereupon I ascended to my lady's chamber, which I entered as diffidently and reverentially as though such visits were not the commonplace of my professional life. As I approached the bed she heaved a little sigh of content and murmured, "'What a fortunate girl I am! To be petted and cared for and pampered in this way! Arabella is a perfect angel, and you, Dr. Gray!' "'Oh, Marion!' I protested. "'Not Dr. Gray!' "'Well, then, Stephen,' she corrected with a faint blush. That is better. And what am I? Never mind, she replied, very pink and smiling. I expect you know. If you don't, ask Arabella when you go down. I expect she will do most of the asking, said I, and I have strict orders not to stop to gossip. So let me see the bandages, and then I must go. I made my inspection without undue hurry, and having seen that all was well, I took her hand. You are to stay here until I have seen you tomorrow morning and you are to be a good girl and try not to think of unpleasant things. Yes, I will do everything that you tell me. Then I can go away happy. Good night, Marian. Good night, Stephen. I pressed her hand and felt her fingers close on mine. Then I turned away, and with only a moment's pause at the door for a last look at the sweet, smiling face, descended the stairs to confront the formidable Arabella. Of my cautious statement and her keen cross-examination I will say nothing. I made the proceedings as short as was decent, for I wanted, if possible, to take counsel with Thorndyke. On my explaining this, the brevity of my account was condoned, and even my refusal of food. But remember, Arabella, I said as she escorted me to the gate, she has had a very severe shock. The less you say to her about the affair for the present, the quicker will be her recovery. With this warning I set forth through the rapidly thinning fog to catch the first conveyance that I could find to bear me southward. Chapter 11 Arms and the Man The fog had thinned to a mere haze when the porter admitted me at the inner temple gate, so that as I passed the cloisters and looked through into Pump Court, I could see the lighted windows of the residence chambers at the far end. The sight of them encouraged me to hope that the chambers in King's Bench Walk might throw out a similar hopeful gleam. Nor was I disappointed, and the warm glow from the windows of number 5A sent me tripping up the stairs profoundly relieved, though a trifle abashed at the untimely hour of my visit. The door was opened by Thorndyke himself, who instantly cut short my apologies. "'Nonsense, Gray!' he exclaimed, shaking my hand. "'It is no interruption at all. "'On the contrary, how beautiful upon the staircase "'are the feet of him that bringeth, well, what sort of tidings?' "'Not good, I am afraid, sir. "'Well, let us have them. "'Come and sit by the fire.' "'He drew up an easy chair, and having installed me in it "'and taken a critical look at me, 
invited me to proceed. I accordingly proceeded bluntly to inform him that an attempt had been made to murder Miss D'Arblay. Huh, he exclaimed, these are bad tidings indeed. I hope she is not injured in any way. I reassured him on this point and gave him the details as to the patient's condition, and he then asked, When did the attempt occur, and how did you hear of it? It happened this evening, and I was present. You were present, he repeated, gazing at me in the utmost astonishment. And what became of the assailant? He vanished into the fog, I replied. Ah, yes, the fog. I had forgotten that. But now let us drop this question and answer method. Give me a narrative from the beginning, with the events in their proper sequence, and omit nothing, no matter how trivial. I took him at his word, up to a certain point. I described my arrival at the studio, the search in the cupboard, the sinister interruption, the attack, and the unavailing attempt at pursuit. As to what befell thereafter, I gave him a substantially complete account, with certain reservations, up to my departure from Ivy Cottage. Then you never saw the man at all? No, but Miss D'Arblay did, and here I gave him such details of the man's appearance as I had been able to gather from Marion. It is quite a vivid description, he said, as he wrote down the details, and now shall we have a look at that piece of the mold? I disinterred it from my tobacco pouch and handed it to him. He glanced at it and then went to a cabinet, from a drawer in which he produced the little case containing Polton's casts of the guinea and a box, which he placed on the table and opened. From it he took a lump of molding wax and a bottle of powdered French chalk. Pinching off a piece of the wax, he rolled it into a ball, dusted it lightly with the chalk powder, and pressed it with his thumb into the mold. It came away on his thumb, bearing a perfect impression of the inside of the mold. That settles it, said he, taking the obverse cast from the case and laying it on the table beside the wax squeeze. The squeeze and the cast are identical. There is now no possible doubt that the electrotype guinea that was found in the pond was made by Julius D'Arblay. Probably it had been delivered by him to the murderer on the very evening of his death. So we are undoubtedly dealing with that same man. It is a most alarming situation. It would be alarming if it were any other man, I remarked. No doubt, he agreed, but there is something very special about this man. He is a criminal of a type that is almost unknown here, but is not uncommon in South European and Slav countries. You find him too in the United States, principally among the foreign-born or alien population. He is not a normal human being. He is an inveterate murderer, to whom a human life does not count at all. And this type of man continually grows more and more dangerous for two reasons. First, the murder habit becomes more confirmed with each crime. Second, there is virtually no penalty for the succeeding murders, for the first one entails the death sentence, and fifty murders can involve no more. This man killed Van Zellen as a mere incident of a robbery. Then he appears to have killed the Arblay to secure his own safety, and he is now attempting to kill Miss the Arblay, apparently for the same reason. And he will kill you and he will kill me if our existence is inconvenient or dangerous to him. We must bear that in mind and take the necessary measures. I can't imagine, said I, what motive he can have for wanting to kill Miss D'Arblay. Probably he believes that she knows something that would be dangerous to him, something connected with those molds, or perhaps something else. We are rather in the dark. We don't know for certain what it was he came to look for when he entered the studio, or whether or not he found what he wanted. But to return to the danger, it is obvious that he knows the Abbey Road district well, for he found his way to the studio in the fog. He may be living close by. There is no reason why he should not be. His identity is quite unknown. That is a horrid thought, I exclaimed. It is, he agreed, but it is the assumption that we have to act upon. We must not leave a loophole unwatched. He mustn't get another chance. No, I concurred warmly. He certainly must not, if we can help it. But it is an awful position. We carry that poor girl's life in our hands, and there is always the possibility that we may be caught off our guard, just for a moment. He nodded gravely. You are quite right, Gray. An awful responsibility rests on us. I am very unhappy about this poor young lady. 
Of course, there is the other side, but at present we are concerned with Miss Diarble's safety. What other side is there? I demanded. I mean, he replied, that if we can hold out, this man is going to deliver himself into our hands. What makes you think that? I asked eagerly. I recognize a familiar phenomenon, he replied. My large experience and extensive study of crimes against the person has shown me that in the overwhelming majority of cases of obscure crimes, the discovery has been brought about by the criminal's own efforts to make himself safe. He is constantly trying to hide his tracks and making fresh ones. Now this man is one of those criminals who won't let well alone. He kills Van Zellen and disappears, leaving no trace. He seems to be quite safe. But he is not satisfied. He can't keep quiet. He kills Diarble, he enters the studio, he tries to kill Miss Diarble, all to make himself more safe. And every time he moves, he tells us something fresh about himself. If we can only wait and watch, we shall have him. What has he told us about himself this time, I asked. We won't go into that now, Gray. We have other business on hand. But you know all that I know as to the facts. If you will turn over those facts at your leisure, you will find that they yield some very curious and striking inferences. I was about to press the question when the door opened and Mr. Poulton appeared on the threshold. Observing me, he crinkled benevolently, and then, in answer to Thorndyke's inquiring glance, said, I thought I had better remind you, sir, that you have not had any supper. Dear me, Poulton, Thorndyke exclaimed. Now you mention it, I believe you are right. And I suspect that Dr. Gray is in the same case. So we place ourselves in your hands. Supper and pistols are what we want. Pistols, sir, exclaimed Poulton, opening his eyes to an unusual extent and looking at us suspiciously. Don't be alarmed, Poulton, Thorndyke chuckled. It isn't a duel. I just want to go over our stock of pistols and ammunition. At this I thought I detected a belligerent gleam in Poulton's eye, but even as I looked he was gone. Not for long, however. In a couple of minutes he was back with a large handbag, which he placed on the table and again retired. Thorndyke opened the bag and took out quite a considerable assortment of weapons, single pistols, revolvers, and automatics, which he laid out on the table, each with its box of appropriate cartridges. I hate firearms, he exclaimed as he viewed the collection distastefully. They are dangerous things, and when it comes to business they are scurvy weapons. Any poltroon can pull a trigger. But we must put ourselves on equal terms with our opponent, who is certain to be provided. Which will you have? I recommend this baby browning for portability. Have you had any practice? Only target practice, but I am a fair shot with a revolver. I have never used an automatic. We will go over the mechanism after supper, said he. Meanwhile, I hear the approach of Poulton, and am conscious of a voracious interest in what he is bringing. When did you feed last? I had tea at the studio about half past four. My poor Gray, he exclaimed. You must be starving. I ought to have asked you sooner. However, here comes relief. He opened a folding table by the fire just as Poulton entered with the tray, on which I was gratified to observe a good-sized dish cover and a claret jug. Holton rapidly laid the little table and then, whisking off the cover, retired with a triumphant crinkle. "'You have a regular kitchen upstairs, I presume,' said I, as we took our seats at the table, as well as a laboratory. "'And a pretty good cook, too, to judge by the results.' Thorndyke chuckled. "'The kitchen and the laboratory are one,' he replied, "'and Poulton is the cook.' An uncommonly good cook, as you suggest, but his methods are weird. These cutlets were probably grilled in the cubal furnace, but I have known him to do a steak with the brazing jet. There is nothing conventional about Poulton, but whatever he does, he does to a finish, which is fortunate, because I thought of calling in his aid in our present difficulty. I looked at him inquiringly, and he continued, If Miss Diarble is to go on with her work, which she ought to, as it is her livelihood, she must be guarded constantly. I had considered applying to Inspector Follett, and we may have to later, but for the present it will be better for us to keep our own counsel and play our own hand. We have two objects in view. First, and paramount, is the necessity of securing Miss Diarbley's safety. But second, we want to lay our hands on this man, not to frighten him away, as we might do if we put the police on his track. When once we have him, her safety is secured forever. 
whereas if he were merely scared away, he would be an abiding menace. We have got to catch him, and at present he is catchable. Securing his unknown identity, he is lurking within reach, ready to strike, but also ready to be pounced upon when we are ready to pounce. Let us keep him confident of his safety while we are gathering up the clues. Hmm, yes, I assented without much enthusiasm. What is it that you propose to do? Somebody, he replied, must keep watch over Miss Diarbley from the moment she leaves her house until she returns to it. How much time, if any, can you give up to this duty? My whole time, I answered promptly. I shall let everything else go. Then, said he, I propose that you and Poulton relieve one another on duty. It will be better than for you to be there all the time. I saw what he meant and agreed at once. The conventions must be respected as far as possible. But, I suggested, isn't Poulton rather a lightweight, if it should come to a scrap, I mean? Don't undervalue small men, even physically, he replied. They are commonly better built than big men and more enduring and energetic. Poulton is remarkably strong, and he has the pluck of a bulldog. But we must see how he is placed as regards work. The question was put to him and the position of affairs explained when he came down to clear the table, whereupon it appeared, from his own account, that he was absolutely without occupation of any kind and pining for something to do. Thorndyke laughed incredulously, but did not contest this outrageous and barefaced untruth, merely remarking, I am afraid it would be rather an idle time for you. Oh, no, it won't, sir, Holton assured him emphatically. I've always wanted to learn something about sculptors molding and wax casting, but I've never had a chance. Now I shall have. And that opportunity isn't going to be wasted. Thorndyke regarded his assistant with a twinkling eye. So it was mere self-seeking that made you so enthusiastic, he said. But you were quite a good molder already. Not a sculptor's molder, sir, replied Poulton, and I know nothing about waxwork. But I shall, before I have been there many days. I am sure you will, said Thorndyke. Miss D'Arblay will have an apprentice and journeyman in one. You will be able to give her quite a lot of help, which will be valuable just now while her hand is disabled. When do you think she will be able to go back to work, Gray? I can't say. Not tomorrow, certainly. Shall I send you a report when I have seen her? Do, he replied. Or better still, come in tomorrow evening and give me the news. So, Poulton, we shan't want you for another day or so. Ah, said Poulton, then I shall be able to finish that recording clock before I go. Upon which Thorndyke and I laughed aloud, and Poulton, his mendacity thus unmasked, retired with the tray, crinkling but unabashed. The short remainder of the evening, or rather of the night, was spent in the study of the mechanism and mode of use of automatic pistols. When I finally bestowed the baby fully loaded in my hip pocket and rose to go, Thorndyke sped me on my way with a few words of warning and advice. Be constantly on your guard, Gray. You are going to make a bitter enemy of a man who knows no scruples. Indeed, you have done so already, and something tells me that he is aware of it. Avoid all solitary or unfrequented places. Keep to main thoroughfares and well-lighted streets, and maintain a diligent lookout for any suspicious appearances. You have said truly that we carry Miss Diarblay's life in our hands. But to preserve her life we must preserve our own, which we should probably prefer to do in any case. Don't get jumpy. I don't much think you will, but keep your attention alert and your weather eyelid lifting. With these encouraging words and a hearty handshake, he let me out and stood watching me as I descended the stairs. Chapter 12 A Dramatic Discovery about eleven o'clock in the forenoon of the third day after the terrible events of that unforgettable night of the great fog, Marion and I drew up on our bicycles opposite the studio door. She was now outwardly quite recovered, excepting as to her left hand, but I noticed that, as I inserted the key into the door, she cast a quick, nervous glance up and down the road, and as we passed through the lobby, she looked down for one moment at the great blood stain on the floor and then hastily averted her face. Now, I said, assuming a brisk, cheerful tone, we must get to work. Mr. Poulton will be here in half an hour, and we must be ready to put his nose on the grindstone at once. Then your nose will have to go on first, she replied with a smile, 
and so will mine, with two raw apprentices to teach and an important job waiting to be done. But dear me, what a lot of trouble I am giving. Nothing of the kind, Marion, I exclaimed. You are a public benefactor. Poulton is delighted at the chance to come here and enlarge his experience. And as for me... Well, as for you? She looked at me half shyly, half mischievously. Go on, you've stopped at the most interesting point. I think I had better not, said I. We don't want the forewoman to get too uppish. She laughed softly, and when I had helped her out of her overcoat and rolled up the sleeve of her one serviceable arm, I went out to the lobby to stow away the bicycles and lock the outer door. When I returned, she had got out from the cupboard a large box of flake gelatin and a massive spouted bucket which she was filling at the sink. Hadn't you better explain to me what we are going to do? I asked. Oh, explanations are of no use, she replied. You just do as I tell you and then you will know all about it. This isn't a school, it's a workshop. When we have got the gelatin into soak, I will show you how to make a plaster case. It seems to me, I retorted, that my instructress has graduated in the Academy of Squeers. W-I-N-D-E-R, Winder. Now go and clean one. Isn't that the method? Apprentices are not allowed to waste time in wrangling, she rejoined severely. Go and put on one of Daddy's blouses and I will set you to work. This practical method of instruction justified itself abundantly. The reasons for each process emerged at once as soon as the process was completed. And it was with all a pleasant method, for there is no comradeship so sympathetic as the comradeship of work, nor any which begets so wholesome and friendly an intimacy. But though there were playful and frivolous interludes, as when the forewoman's working hand became encrusted with clay and had to be cleansed with a sponge by the apprentice, we worked to such purpose that by the time Mr. Poulton was due, the plaster bust, of which a wax replica was to be made, was firmly fixed on the work table on a clay foundation and surrounded by a carefully leveled platform of clay in which it was embedded to half its thickness. I had just finished smoothing the surface when there came a knock at the outer door, on which Marion started violently and clutched my arm. But she recovered in a moment and exclaimed in a tone of vexation, how silly I am! Of course, it is Mr. Poulton. It was. I found him on the threshold in rapt contemplation of the knocker and looking rather like an archdeacon on tour. He greeted me with a friendly crinkle and I then conducted him into the studio and presented him to Marion, who shook his hand warmly and thanked him so profusely for coming to her aid that he was quite abashed. However, he did not waste time in compliments but producing an apron from his handbag, took off his coat, donned the apron, rolled up so sleeves, and beamed inquiringly at the bust. "'We are going to make a plaster case for the gelatin mold, Mr. Poulton,' Marion explained, and proceeded to a few preliminary directions, to which the new apprentice listened with respectful attention. But she had hardly finished when he fell to work with a quiet, unhurried facility that filled me with envy. He seemed to know where to find everything.' He discovered the waste paper with which to cover the model to prevent the clay from sticking to it. He pounced on the clay bin at the first shot, and when he had built up the shape for the case, found the plaster bin, mixing bowl, and spoon as if he had been born and bred in the workshop, stopping only for a moment to test the condition of the gelatin in the bucket. Mr. Poulton, Marion said, after watching him for a while, you are an impostor, a dreadful impostor. You pretend to come here as an improver, but you really know all about gelatin molding now, don't you? Poulton admitted apologetically that he had done a little in that way. But, he added in extenuation, I have never done any work in wax. And talking of wax, the doctor will be here presently. Dr. Thorndyke? Marion asked. Yes, miss. He had some business in Holloway, so he thought he would come on here to make your acquaintance and take a look at the premises. All the same, Mr. Poulton, said I, I don't quite see the connection between Dr. Thorndyke and Wax. He crinkled with a slightly embarrassed air and explained that he must have been thinking of something that the doctor had said to him, but his explanations were cut short by a knock at the door. That is his knock, said Poulton, and he and I together proceeded to open the door, 
when I inducted the distinguished visitor into the studio and presented him to the presiding goddess. I noticed that each of them inspected the other with some curiosity, and that the first impressions appeared to be mutually satisfactory, though Marion was at first a little overawed by Thorndyke's impressive personality. You mustn't let me interrupt your work, the latter said, when the preliminary politeness had been exchanged. I have just come to fill in Dr. Gray's outlying sketches with details of my own observing. I wanted to see you, to convert a name into an actual person, to see the studio for the same reason, and to get as precise a description as possible of the man whom we are trying to identify. Will it distress you to recall his appearance? She had turned a little pale at the mention of her late assailant, but she answered stoutly enough, Not at all. Besides, it is necessary. Thank you, said he, Then I will read out the description that I had from Dr. Gray, and we will see if you can add anything to it. He produced the notebook, from which he read out the particulars that I had given him, at the conclusion of which he looked at her inquiringly. I think that is all that I remember, she said. There was very little light, and I really only glanced at him. Thorndyke looked at her reflectively. It is a fairly full description, said he. Perhaps the nose is a little sketchy, you speak of a hooked nose with a high bridge. Was it a curved nose of the Jewish type or a squarer Roman nose? It was rather square in profile, a Wellington nose, but with a rather broad base, like a vulture's beak and very large. Was it actually a hooked nose? I mean, had it a drooping tip? Yes, the tip projected downwards and was rather sharp, not bulbous. And the chin, should you call it a pronounced or retreating chin? Oh, it was quite a projecting chin, rather of the Wellington type. Thorndyke reflected once more, then having jotted down the answers to his questions, he closed the book and returned it to his pocket. It is a great thing to have a trained eye, he remarked. In your one glance you saw more than an ordinary person would have noted in a leisurely inspection in a good light. You have no doubt that you would know this man again if you should meet him? Not the slightest, she replied with a shudder. I can see him now if I shut my eyes. Well, he rejoined with a smile, I wouldn't recall that unpleasant vision too often if I were you. And now, may I, without disturbing you further, just take a look round the premises? But of course, Dr. Thorndyke, she replied, do exactly what you please. With this permission, he drew away and stood for some moments, letting a very reflective eye travel round the interior. And meanwhile, I watched him curiously and wondered what he had really come for. His first proceeding was to walk slowly round the studio and examine closely, one by one, all the casts which hung on pegs. Next, in the same systematic manner, he inspected all the shelves, mounting a chair to examine the upper ones. It was after scrutinizing one of the latter that he turned towards Marion and asked, "'Have you moved these casts lately, Miss D'Arblay?' No, she replied, so far as I know, they have not been touched for months. Someone has moved them within the last day or two, said he. Apparently the nocturnal explorer went over the shelves as well as the cupboard. I wonder why, said Marion. There were no molds on the shelves. Thorndyke made no rejoinder, but as he stood on the chair he once more ran his eye round the studio. Suddenly he stepped down from the chair, picked it up, carried it over to the tall cupboard, and once more mounted it. His stature enabled him easily to look over the cornice onto the top of the cupboard, and it was evident that something there had attracted his attention. Here is a derelict of some sort, he announced, which certainly has not been moved for some months. As he spoke, he reached over the cornice into the enclosed space and lifted out an excessively grimy plaster mask, from which he blew the thick coating of dust and then stood for a while looking at it thoughtfully. A striking face, this, he remarked, but not attractive. It rather suggests a Russian or Polish Jew. Do you recognize the person, Miss D'Arblay? He stepped down from the chair and handed the mask to Marion, who had advanced to look at it, and who now held it in her hand, regarding it with a frown of perplexity. This is very curious, she said. I thought I knew all the casts that had been made here but I have never seen this one before, and I don't know the face. I wonder who he was. It doesn't look like an English face, but I should hardly have taken it for the face of a Jew, 
with that rather small and nearly straight nose. The East European Jews are not a very pure breed, said Thorndyke. You will see many a face of that type in Whitechapel High Street and the Jewish quarters hard by. At this point, deserting the work table, I came and looked over Marion's shoulder at the mask which she was holding at arm's length. And then I got a surprise of the most singular kind, for I recognized the face at a glance. What is it, Gray? asked Thorndyke, who had apparently observed my astonishment. This is the most extraordinary coincidence, I exclaimed. Do you remember my speaking to you about a certain Mr. Morris? The dealer in antiquities, he queried. Yes. Well, this is his face. He regarded me for some moments with a strangely intent expression. Then he asked, When you say that this is Morris's face, do you mean that it resembles his face, or that you identify it positively? I identify it positively. I can swear to the identity. It isn't a face that one would forget. And if any doubt were possible, there is this hair lip scar, which you can see quite plainly on the cast. Yes, I noticed that. And Morris has a hair lip scar, hasn't he? Yes, and in the same position and of the same character. I think you can take it as a fact that this cast was undoubtedly taken from Morris's face. Which, said Thorndyke, is a really important fact and one that is worth looking into. In what way is it important? I asked. In this respect, he answered. This man, Morris, is unknown to Miss D'Arbley, but he was not unknown to her father. Here we have evidence that Mr. D'Arbley had dealings with people of whom his daughter had no knowledge. The circumstances of the murder made it clear that there must be such people, but here we have proof of their existence and we can give to one of them a local habitation and a name. And you will notice that this particular person is a dealer in curios and possibly in more questionable things. There is just a hint that he may have had some rather queer acquaintances. He seemed to have had rather a fancy for plaster masks, I remarked. I remember that he had one in his shop window. Did your father make many life or death masks as commissions, Miss D'Arblay? Thorndyke asked. Only one or two, so far as I know, she replied. There is very little demand for portrait masks nowadays. Photography has superseded them. That is what I should have supposed, said he. This would be just a chance commission. However, as it establishes the fact that this man Morris was in some way connected with your father, I think I should like to have a record of his appearance. May I take this mask away with me to get a photograph of it made? I will take great care of it and let you have it back safely. Certainly, replied Marion, but why not keep it? If it is of any interest to you, I have no use for it. That is very good of you, said he, and if you will give me some rag and paper to pack it in, I will take myself off and leave you to finish your work in peace. Marion took the cast from him and, having procured some rag and paper, began very carefully to wrap it up. While she was thus engaged, Thorndyke stood, letting his eye travel once more round the studio. I see, he remarked, that you have quite a number of masks molded from life or death, though I understand that they were not commissions. Very few of them were, Marion replied. Most of them were taken from professional models, but some from acquaintances whom my father bribed with the gift of a duplicate mask. But why did he make them? They could not have been used for producing wax faces for the show figures, for you could hardly turn a shop window into a waxwork exhibition with lifelike portraits of real persons. No, Marion agreed, that wouldn't do at all. These masks were principally used for reference as to details of features when my father was modeling a head in clay. But he did sometimes make molds for the wax from these masks, only he obliterated the likeness, so that the wax face was not a portrait. By working on the wax, I suppose... Yes, or more usually by altering the mask before making the mold. It is quite easy to alter a face. Let me show you. She lifted one of the masks from its peg and laid it on the table. You see, she said, that this is the face of a young girl, one of my father's models. It is a round, smooth, smiling face with a very short, weak chin and a projecting upper lip. We can change all that in a moment. She took up a lump of clay and, pinching off a pellet, laid it on the right cheekbone and spread it out. Having treated the other side in the same manner, she rolled an elongated pellet, 
with which she built up the lower lip. Then, with a larger pellet, she enlarged the chin downwards and forwards, and having added a small touch to each of the eyebrows, she dipped a sponge in thick clay water, or slip, and dabbed the mask all over to bring it to a uniform color. There, she said. It is very rough, but you see what I mean. The result was truly astonishing. The weak, chubby, girlish face had been changed by these few touches into the strong, coarse face of a middle-aged woman. It is really amazing, I exclaimed. It is a perfectly different face. I wouldn't have believed that such a thing was possible. It is a most striking and interesting demonstration, said Thorndyke. But yet I don't know that we need be so surprised. If we consider that of all the millions of persons in this island alone, each one has a face which is different from any other, and yet all those faces are made up of the same anatomical parts, we realize that the differences which distinguish one face from another must be excessively subtle and minute. We do, agreed Marion, especially when we are modeling a portrait bust and the likeness won't come, although every part appears to be correct and all the measurements seem to agree. A true likeness is an extraordinarily subtle and exact piece of work. So I have always thought, said Thorndyke, but I mustn't delay you any longer. May I have my precious parcel? Marion handed him the not very presentable bundle with a smile and a bow. He then took his leave of her and I escorted him to the door, where he paused for a moment as we shook hands. You are bearing my advice in mind, I hope, Gray, he said. As to keeping clear of unfrequented places? Yes, I have been very careful in that respect, and I never go abroad without the pistol. It is in my hip pocket now. But I have seen no sign of anything to justify so much caution. I doubt if our friend is even aware of my existence, and in any case, I don't see that he is anything against me, excepting as Miss Diarble's watchdog. Don't be too sure, Gray, he rejoined earnestly. There may be certain little matters that you have overlooked. At any rate, don't relax your caution. Give all unfrequented places a wide berth and keep a bright lookout. With this final warning, he turned away and strode off down the road while I re-entered the studio just in time to see Polton mix the first bowl of plaster. As Marion, having washed the clay from the transformed mask, dried it and rehung it on its peg. 